Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. All our overseas believers as well, let's get, confess together. The truth will set you free. Today's message is entitled, The Person of Faith Who Stands Firm on the Truth. There's an interesting saying. They say, when Americans go to buy something, they ask, is this the most expensive? And that's what they ask. And then Germans, Germans tend to ask when buying something, is this the most durable? And the French ask, is this the newest model? And you know what Koreans ask? What about Koreans? Is this real? That's how much Koreans doubt a lot. They do not trust easily because our nation has been scarred so much that because we were born into that and raised that way and were educated that way. Our nation, Koreans, have a lot of doubt and they're not very trusting. And in some way, Korea has one of the highest IQ and it is one of the nations that uniquely has an IQ that hit three number IQ among nations. And so we are very good at making counterfeit, making things, making fake things seem very real. And we call those counterfeits. And the average eye won't be able to even see the difference whether something is real or fake. And so in 2023, the counterfeit market, the market that sells these fake products, was valued at around 14 billion US dollars, making it the 10th largest in the world. So in Korean one, that's close to 20 trillion one. And Curry's ability to produce fake luxury goods has even become a dishonorable attraction for even foreign tourists. Nowadays, with the artific artificial intelligence, it's become even harder and more difficult to distinguish the real from the fake. So it's not just physical products, but even, even deep fake technology, which is often called the next generation counterfeits. What deep fake technology does is that it allows computers to use vast amounts of data to create lifelike images, voices, and gestures of individuals. So they can, it, it creates these images and videos of, of individuals. And so in, in some churches, they even use AI. They use AI for pastors to preach on Sunday online. So for example, it can replace a person's face in a video with someone else's or perfectly replicate their voice. And so last night at around 10 p.m., there was a, a TV show where there were some professors who were discussing about deep fake technology and they showed the technology and it, it showed how in one second they can change a person's face with this technology to make it seem like it's a different person. Even their voices are can be replicated. And it has significant potential for this technology to be used for criminal misuse because it can completely damage someone's reputation and fame and it can invade their privacy as well and it's creating a lot of problems that way and i was while well, i was watching that tv show with these professors discussing the deep fake 
technology. They were talking about Elon Musk, who is one of the richest men on Earth. And the all the they they were all multi multi billionaires. For us, it's even it's too much for us to even fathom how much money they have. But Elon Musk is tremendously rich, and so he invested millions of dollars, and that was this deep fake. So he, there was this one person who had approached Elon Musk to for him to invest. And so he invested millions of dollars, but then he realized it was actually a deep fake scam, a scam using this deep fake technology. And so apparently the, these professors, they were talking about how if you look very, very closely, you can tell the difference. But for most of us, we won't, would be able to tell between the whether it's real or fake. So throughout history, in the past or in the present, the problem of distinguishing between the real and fake has always existed. And this is not, it's not only in our daily lives, but also in our spiritual lives. In today's passage, the Apostle John emphasizes the importance of standing firm in the truth by discerning true faith from false faith. And he calls us to become people of faith, to stand firm on the truth. To stand firm on the truth. How can we stand firm on the truth? Then we must know the truth first. We must first know the truth in order for us to stand firm on the truth. You need to know the truth. And where is the truth? It's the truth is found in the infallible, the, the word of God that has no mistakes, no errors, the Bible. And that is why the Protestant Reformation emphasized not an individual, but they emphasized sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone. And so no matter how insignificant a person may be, if they only speak about the Bible, then we must believe in what they say because we must only believe in the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is to the same today, yesterday, and forever. And when we know this truth, this one and only unchanging truth, we experience true freedom. You will know the truth, and the truth will what? It will set you free. All parts of your life will be set free. And that's why people who know th this truth, they are indivi individuals who are completely free. They're not serious. And they don't make anything too complicated at all. Why? Because it says to entrust all our worries to God. Pass it over. There are no problems. If there are problems when you believe in Jesus, of course there are problems. Of course there are many problems. Individually, in our church, or in your ministries and jobs, there may be problems. But those problems are not a problem. Why? Because there is an answer behind that. And so there is no reason for you to lose sleep over that. Just entrust it to God. That is the privilege of individuals who know the truth. It will set you free. And what happens when you're set free? You become healthy, both spiritually and physically. You become confident. You don't have to think about what others think here and there. There's no reason for you to be discouraged. But because you do not know the truth, you are afraid. And so through today's passage, the Apostle Paul the Apostle John talks about the unseen spiritual realities. Spiritual realities cannot be seen with our eyes, but without the knowledge of the truth, we are easily deceived. How can we have spiritual discernment and live a life of victory? The, a walk of faith is a spiritual battle. We do not fight with people. If you're fighting with people, then you've already lost. Oh, I don't like that person. You've already lost. You're already seized by Satan. You're already seized by hatred. And so what is our walk of faith? It is a spiritual battle. Let's say it together, a spiritual battle. So even if it's just for this week, when problems come, 
just think and remember, oh, this is a spiritual battle. Even if you just say that, you already have victory. It's a spiritual battle. And so if you're despising a person and you hate that person, you're already lost. An invisible adversary, an enemy is constantly on the move, seeking to devour us 24 hours. And that's why if you're not awake 24 hours and are able to discern, then you will be attacked easily. That's therefore, all Yewon believers, may you all stand firm on the absolute truth of the gospel. And I bless you in the name of the Lord that you may expand the tents of your spiritual and physical lives and have the evidence to live victoriously. Point number one, the wisdom to discern spirits. Let's look up verse one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so this talk talks about the spiritual realities. Humans have both a physical body and a spirit. And so it's only humans that have this because animals only have a flesh. But only human beings have the spirit of God, and so they are spiritual beings. And that is why it's only humans that when they die, they cremate their bodies and you bury their bodies because their, their flesh is no longer in need. And so we both have a physical body and a spiritual body. But when it comes to the spirit, you can't see it. And so we're spiritual beings, but you can't see the spirit. And you cannot see this, the spirit, but we are, we follow and the spirit. And so among spirits, there are spirits that belong to God, and there is a spirit that does not belong to God. And so it easily put, if you look at verse 6, it says that there is a spirit of truth and there are spirits of deception, including the Antichrist, the spirits of the Antichrist. And the leader of these deceiving spirits is Satan, and his followers are demons. They are spirits of deception and so cults and heresies they say oh only we have salvation the jehovah's witnesses they have they worship on saturday they don't even acknowledge sunday worship and they believe that they're the only ones who can receive salvation and even the unified church they you know they have tremendous amount of accumulated wealth as a church and they come together And those influenced by such false spirits are the false prophets. And at that time when John was recording this, this scripture, there were these individuals inside the church and they were bringing a lot of confusion and turmoil in the church. And that is why the Apostle John stresses the importance of having wisdom to discern spirits. Because without proper discernment to be able to discern false spirits, believers might think they are living in faith or walking a walk of faith, but actually they are trapped in religion and legalism. And they suffer the same struggles and confusion as unbelievers. If you look at people trapped in religion and legalism, they live in anxieties and worries. In other words, they are being deceived by Satan's deceptions. Do you think Satan will give you good things? What he gives you is anxieties, worries, di division, arguments, fights. That's what he does. If you look at John 8.44, it reveals that Satan, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, from the very beginning. 
because there is no, no truth and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Similarly, 1 Peter 5, 8 warns that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Or those who do not have faith, those who are not who do not base their faith on the word of God. So what they do is attack these individuals so that they may be discouraged, so that they may be able to forget and not be able to enjoy their identity authority as God's children. So the identity as a child of God is such a tremendous thing, but Satan's goal is to prevent believers from enjoying that so that they may live like unbelievers, so that they may not be able to use any of their authority. If that's so, then how can we discern these deceiving spirits? How do we discern them? Look, look at verses 2 to 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And so what is the standard by which we can discern spirits? It, it's not whether someone can perform miracles or give accurate prophecies or heal something. Even Satan and demons can perform such acts to deceive. Even shamans, they can heal sicknesses. And sometimes they can even expel evil uh, demons. And sometimes they may heal sicknesses. Even Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He then, in the end, he declares, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so it, this means that even those who have false spirits can perform works. But so you must not be swayed by that because you must be able to clearly discern and what is the method and the standard for discernment it is whether they emphasize Jesus Christ the key is whether one believes that Jesus came to this earth as a Christ to save humanity which was separated from God trapped in sin enslaved by Satan and destined for eternal destruction so does one believe in this or not? That is the core. I believe that all our Yehwan believers believe in this. Jesus came as my Christ and he has saved and solved all my problems. If you say amen to that, it is all. That is the core. So do these individuals believe in the incarnation of Jesus, that he is 100% God and 100% human in nature. First John 22, 20, 22 says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And so if they deny the Son, they do not have the Father. And cults and heresies, they deny Christ. They, they claim that they are the Christ, they, that they are the Savior. They have no Christ. And if they do not have Christ, what happens? He, they, God, the, God, the Father does not acknowledge them, so they do not have God. And so the Church of God, they call their leaders God, or they call their leaders uh, 
to, they claim that they are the saviors and the prophets. However, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 5, Jesus answers the disciples' question about the signs of the end of the age. He says, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. They will lead many astray. Jesus already said this. And so, the Apostle John already highlights that this is happening and that Jesus had already warned us about this. During John's time, there was a prominent heretical group who were called the Gnostics. The Gnostics were individuals who claimed that they were only the only ones who would be saved. And they claimed that they had this mysterious spiritual knowledge that allowed them to that allowed only them to be saved. So they argued that what is invisible is good and what is visible is evil. So they argued that all the things that can be seen is good, but all the things that cannot be seen is evil. So in the end, they argued that an invisible spirit, invisible God who is good can come as a dirty flesh, as a dirty visible body. So in other words, they denied God, the incarnation of Jesus and his divine nature. And so they, they claim, they rejected the idea that the holy God could take on sinful flesh and they denied and they claim that the spirit of God temporarily entered Jesus at his baptism and departed Jesus' body during his crucifixion. And this belief known as docetism suggests that Jesus only appeared to have a physical body but was not truly incarnate or was not truly God. And this might sound plausible or possible to some, but do not be deceived. So at that time, false teachers in John's time spread such lies within the church and eventually left with their followers. So the Apostle John identifies them as antichrists. He says every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist, he says. Matt, Peter confesses in Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so we make that confession and then worship. It's the absolute truth. And we must stand firm on this absolute truth. And the church must stand on this absolute truth to not crumble. Jesus said that I will build my church on this rock. Nothing will move this church. J.J. Packer, a British theologian, diagnoses the weakness of today's church in his book, Knowing God. He says, the root of the church's weakness today is ignorance of God, ignorance both of his gospel and of the practice of communion with him. He emphasizes that when believers correctly understand the truth of the gospel and maintain spiritual communion with God and fellowship with God, the church can fulfill its role. However, if a church fails to do so, they will not be able to carry out the role as a church. In Matthew 7, 16 to 20, Jesus provides an important standard for discerning false prophets, their fruits. What is the difference between a, a fake and a, and what is real? He says that a good fruit, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. And he warns that every tree does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And he says, you will recognize them by their fruits. I bless every member and believer of Yewon Church to have the wisdom to discern spirits in their daily lives and to bear the beautiful fruit that Jesus emphasized, becoming true disciples of Christ in the name of the Lord. Number two, victory in the truth. Verse four says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Apostle John 
clearly explains what happens when the spirit of truth confronts the spirit of deception. Simply put, the spirit of deception stands no chance before the spirit of truth. Why? Because Jesus Christ has already completely defeated Satan on the cross. And that is why if Satan tries to bring you anxieties and worries, call upon the name of Jesus. Jesus said that call upon my name in days of tribulation and I will save you from that. He has destroyed the head of Satan. He is nothing now. No matter what fears you may have, may you call upon the name of Jesus. If you look at John 16, 33, it says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. And so many unbelievers, they think that when Jesus died on the cross, that was the end of it. But no, he resurrected in three days, and that resurrection overcame all things. Even though they crucified him, if, he had, if his death was the end of it, then we would have lost. But by his resurrection, he has overcome the world. The term overcome in today's passage is in the perfect tense, meaning the decisive victory has already been accomplished and its effect, the effect of victory continues to this day. If we have the life of Jesus in us, then we can naturally be victorious in spiritual battles. It's not us who defeat Satan, but it is by the life of Jesus in us that we can defeat Satan. If you look at James 4, 7, it says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When I was a layman, and I did not really have the opportunity to really resist the devil, but after I became a pastor, when I would be called to to meet people, there were many strange people who would come. And because when I was first pioneering my church, and so I've, it's not like I've ever cast out demons. It was never like I've healed any sicknesses. But in the Bible, when it, it showed how when they called upon the name of Jesus that they healed these individuals, and perform miracles. So when I did it, believing that, believing scripture, I saw how it actually took place and it shocked me. And that is why all those who believe in Jesus, that authority has already been given to you. So it's up to you whether you use it or not and if, whether you believe or not. If you believe, it will happen. If you don't believe, it won't happen. And so it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. What happens when the light when light shines, darkness is naturally bound to flee. And so the real will remain. If the if you really, really have Jesus' power and Jesus' life in you, then darkness cannot come to you. Curses cannot come to you. Even if thousands of people curse you, it doesn't matter. Because as long as you have the life of Jesus in you, that's how confident we must be. And that's why when Martin Luther at that time, even when the church summoned him, he praised God. And he said, the Lord is my fortress. fortress. And he praised and he entered into the, his trial. And so at that time, he, he completely fought the spiritual battle that way by himself. Beloved believers, you truly possess the life and the power of Jesus. May you not be deceived. All Satan does is deceive you. He can't do anything else. All he does is just deceive you. Inside all the various problems that you may have, God has already given you the power of life, so you may have victory in that. We've already been guaranteed victory. We've all, we already have victory. And so when you confirm that, what is it that you enjoy? It is a biblical walk of faith. Do not be oppressed. May you be thankful. And so we live such comfortable lives. 
when we were when I was young, it was difficult for us to eat three meals a day, and that's why Koreans they always ask, "Did you eat?" But nowadays, people don't even eat because they want to go on a diet. That's how privileged we've become. In the world, there uh, there are seven point there are seven billion people. And many people live with only $100 a month. Many countries are that impoverished. It's difficult for many people. And so God is using Korea. What does Trump say? Trump says that Korea is a rich country. They say that Trump said that oh, Korea is such a money, a wealthy nation. Why is it that we have to help them that much? But that's how much people, that's how people perceive Korea. Next year, it'll be about our multi-ethnics. There are, there are 2.6 million foreigners in Korea. And when we are able to recommission these foreigners who are in our nation back to their nation, that would be tremendous works. And God ha has been sending these multi-ethnics to our country. In Seoul, there are a lot of Americans. And in, the, in other regions, so the rest of the foreigners have spread out to the other re regions in Korea. And so the direction of how we will enlarge the place of our tent, we are trying to we're trying to think about how we must align our direction to enlarge the place of our tent. So may you anticipate the New Year's message. Let's look at Verse four, 5 to 6, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The apostle John explains that those who belong to the spirit of truth listen to the message of God delivered by John and the other disciples and live a life of obedience to the word of God. And so when the word is proclaimed, they live a life that obeys the word and follows the word. As Jesus says in John 10, 27, Jesus himself says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And on the contrary, those who belong to the spirit of deception behave in the exact opposite way. They say, oh, but still, they don't receive the word as is. They still doubt the word. They do not receive grace because the spirit of deception is in them. The Apostle Paul describes them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. He says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The defining characteristic of those who follow Satan's activity and belong to the spirit of deception what is their main characteristic? Is that they reject the love of the truth. They do not receive the love of the truth. The truth is their standard, but they do not receive the, the love of truth. So in other words, they do not receive and accept the truth of the Bible. And so we must live a life that only reacts and responds to the truth, the word of God. When we are, uh, when we remain in the truth, we experience the joy of victory. And that is the greatest characteristic of a child of God. 
And so a child of God, when they hear the truth, their spirit rejoices, their heart starts beating. Today's passage, 1 John 4, verses 1 to 6, has a unique structure. It emphasizes living firmly grounded in the absolute truth. But on, on the front and, and the back, it, it, it's surrounded by a message to love one another. Beginning in verse 7, John reiterates that God is love. He, John reiterates that God is love. That is the main theme, that God is love. When I was in theology seminary, we would visit churches on Wednesdays. And at that time, there was a, a church of love, a church called Church of Love. And on the pulpit, on, uh, I still remember the church and their pulpit, it said, God is love. And so when I first started my church, I started by saying, God is love. The God is love. That is the overarching, the main theme. He, God is not someone who, who's waiting for you to make a mistake. But God is love. And that is why it is just right for us to love each other. And this is what it emphasizes. So in the beginning, it says to love one another. And after today's passage, again, it emphasizes love. It's like from verses 1 to 6, it's like a sandwich. In between love, in between God's love, what is in the middle, it is the truth, the absolute truth. And what does this talk about? It means that love starts from the truth. Those who do not know the truth cannot love. And so love starts from the truth. The church must be a community, a unity firmly rooted in the absolute truth of the gospel and characterized by loving each other. It shouldn't be about, oh, I do this, I do that. That's not what is important. What's important is how much you love because love forgives all. You must not have any motives. You must not, in order to embrace all things, you must not have any motives. But if you have your own plans, your own motives, then you wouldn't be able to do that. It would be uncomfortable. And so with the tool of misunderstanding, that's how Satan divides people. He touches the ego and the pride that is within people, and that's how he completely severs relationships and divides relationships in the church. But if you know the truth, then you are able to completely understand each other and embrace each other. And that's why, oh, what I do and what I not do, that's not, the church is not the place for you to discuss that. But what you, what you must remember is that God is love. No matter how much you pray, if you don't have the love of God and you do not love each other, then that's fake. Even if you evangelize a lot and if you don't, even if you evangelize a lot and pray a lot and come to church, but you do not love each other, then that's all fake. A unity of love. This is what Yewon Church must be. No matter how much Satan tries to shake you, may you only hold on to the pulpit. Because the absolute value of the gospel is to create that unity of love and so may you expand the tent of influence for God's kingdom. This is the conclusion. There is a professor named Kim chang Ok, known for his lectures on communication. He's a Korean professor. And he, he actually was raised in a very tumultuous upbringing, but he, he's a very, he's very good with his lectures. And during one of his lectures, this one female student question, asked him a question. The female student said, my boyfriend is going to the military. Should I wait for him or not? And the professor replied this way. The professor said, it's an opportunity. And so the, the student, confused, asked, 
an opportunity, an opportunity to break up. And so the professor, Kim, explained, it's an opportunity to confirm whether you truly like him or if you've been mistaken into thinking that you do. The same principle applies to our spiritual life. When the problems and events arise, you, it is an opportunity for us to examine whether our faith is real or if we have been deceiving ourselves into thinking we believe. So all Yewon believers, may you not only call out to the Lord with your mouth saying, Lord, Lord, but in the midst of trials and events and problems, may you shine even brighter and may you have the complete faith that looks only to Jesus Christ, expanding the kingdom of God as true disciples of Christ. Let us pray. Father God, may all our Yewon believers stand firm on the truth. May they, be no, may they be able to know how to discern spiritually and in the face of problems, may they realize that it's a time for them to hold on to the word and to experience the love of God. May they not be deceived and swayed by that and be discouraged by that, but instead may they receive new strength. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.